And it so happens that uh, they actually are connected. And the question is, how good is this connection and is it useful? So we'll, we'll try to answer these questions. That, that's the main motto of this talk. So first we'll start with uh, stable random fields. What are they? So, so before I start, let me just tell you all the random variables, random processes, random vectors, everything will be on one probability space. And the corresponding uh, operator uh, it would be this uh, E, uh, math PBE, expectation of probability math PBE. Okay, so random variable X. So since there are people who are not necessarily from probability, I'll just like to remind you, it's just a measurable map from this probability space omega to R. This is said to follow symmetric alpha stable distribution, where alpha is between zero and two, zero is not allowed, two is allowed, and a scale parameter sigma, which is positive but finite and it's denoted by this i'll just say s alpha s instead of saying symmetric alpha stable if the fourier transform of x or the characteristic function of x is given by this particular function here of course this is only for theta in r and that's all that matters and uh, it can be shown that there is such a random variable in other words there exists a random variable such that its fourier transform is given by this particular form now, the major reference for this kind of random variables is the book, uh, the monograph of Samornitsky and Taku, and Samornitsky was my PhD advisor, by the way. So, two known cases are alpha equal to two and alpha equal to one, which uh, give rise to the normal distribution and the Cauchy distribution, let's say. For this talk, we will allow the Cauchy distribution, but not the normal distribution, in the sense that, okay, when I say Cauchy, I mean two-sided Cauchy, okay? That's, by the way, I should have mentioned that, this is, this is a Fourier transform of a random variable, which is, uh, which is real value. Therefore, it follows immediately that X and minus X have the same distribution. So in particular, X has symmetric distribution around zero. So this is a symmetric Cauchy, and this is a Gaussian, usual Gaussian, symmetric Gaussian. Okay. We'll assume in this talk, we won't allow the normal distribution. We will allow the Cauchy though, the symmetric Cauchy. So we'll assume that alpha is strictly between zero and two. So it's a non-Gaussian symmetric alpha stable distribution. Now, this will immediately tell you, with the help of a Tauberian theorem, that the tail of X, since it's a symmetric distribution, I can as well take the absolute value of X and take, look at the tail of that. This will be some constant that depends on alpha times X power minus alpha as X goes to infinity. So the, it's, in other words, this has power law tails. So Antar in his talk kept on calling us heavy tailed people. So this is why, because we have heavy tails. Okay, so uh, in particular, expectation of the, the, the pth moment is finite if and only p is less than alpha. Okay, so then uh, what are the symmetric alpha stable random fields? So suppose, by the way, if you have any question, answer in the uh, ask in the chat. I won't be able to see the chat as Yogesh said, but uh, I'll be able to. Uh, <coughs> if Yogesh asks me, I can answer that. Okay, so we'll for random any random field in general means a stochastic process, namely a collection of random variables indexed by some high dimensional set. It can be RD, it can be the manifold. It, for us, it will be a group. So we'll start with a countable, but possibly non-commutative group with identity element E and a collection of random variables indexed by this group G, all defined on the same probability space that we have decided to define all our random variables on. Such a collection is called a symmetric alpha stable random field. If any finite linear combination of these XTs, okay, when the scalars are coming from real, because the random variables are real value here, that follows a symmetric alpha stable distribution. So each of them will have a symmetric alpha stable distribution. The alphas would be the same for all such linear combinations. Sigmas, of course, will vary and it will depend on these CRs. Symmetric alpha stable random field, it's called less stationary. If, if you shift on the left side by any element from the group, it doesn't change the distribution. So in other words, the distribution of the random field is invariant with respect to the left shift. Okay. So important special cases would be when G equals some set D or G is a free group or there are other, other possibilities like lamplight or hyperbolic group, Heisenberg and so on. Now there is also some ergodic theory connection to this thing. And that comes through this non-singular group action. 
I'll first tell you that and then tell you what is the connection with stable random fields. So suppose you have a countable group with identity element E just like before. Then a collection of maps is called a non-singular, also called quasi-invariant G action on some sigma finite standard measure space. So in other words, you have a nice enough space, nice enough measure space, which is standard portal and the measure is sigma finite. If the following happens, first of all, this phi t is a collection that acts measurably on, on this set S in the sense that each phi t is a measurable map from S to S and phi of t1 dot t2 is phi t2 composed phi t1 and phi of e is the identity map and phi of t1 dot t2 is phi t2 composed phi t1. I should mention that if you're more used to the group action notation from algebra, I'm actually reversing it. t1 dot t2 is becoming phi t2 composed phi t1 and this is because I'm looking at left stationary random fields as we will see. If I had looked at right stationary random fields, then you would have been the other way around. So in other words, if you're more used to the algebraic notation of uh, group action, then phi t is just the map of s going to t inverse dot s. Anyway, this, is, this, this, this just makes phi t a group action. So this is a, a bunch of maps that acts measurably on s. What makes it non-singular or quasi-invariant this property, which says, first of all, phi t, all the phi t's are now one, one and on two because, uh, because of these properties. So therefore, phi, mu composed phi t is indeed a measure on S. If all of those measures are actually have the same null sets, in other words, all of those measures are equivalent to each other, then we say that this is quasi-invariant or non-singular. So in other words, I am saying that all, say, mu composed phi t and mu are absolutely continuous with respect to each other. So they have the same null sets. So they belong to the same measure class, in other words. One special case would be when they're actually all equal. Mu composed phi t equal to mu for all t. This, in this case, we will say that the action is measure preserving, mu measure preserving. That's a special case. Of course, uh, there are non-singular actions which are not measure preserving. Now, for uh, if you want to know more about them, these are the standard references. By the way, all the references I'll be putting in uh, the end of my slide, and I'll share the slide with uh, the organizers of uh, BPS. And then you can definitely uh, take it from there. Or they might, they actually put it on the website also. Okay. So this is the work that is, I think, in the probabilistic side of this uh, talk. This is the most technical one. And this connects the ergodic theory with the probability theory. Okay. So I have told you that there is some object, which is a symmetric alpha stable random field indexed by a group, okay. which is essentially uh, an object that's coming from probability. It's a, it's a stochastic process indexed by a group, which is, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, for all finite dimensional, all, all the finite linear combinations follow symmetric alpha stable distribution. Now, you know, we know that once you know all the finite linear combinations, we know all the finite dimensional distributions, and therefore we know the entire law of the process. Now, given such a, random field station and, and suppose it's stationary whenever I call stationary I mean left stationary okay, unless mentioned otherwise whenever you see such a thing there can there will exist three things one a sigma finite standard measure space s with a sigma finite measure mu on it so it's a standard Borel space okay that's going to be important at one point in this talk and a function s to r a real valued function which is in L alpha in the sense that it's L alpha, I'll call it, I'll abuse the term and call it L alpha norm. This L alpha norm is finite. This is the L alpha norm. Okay? If you take the F power alpha and then power one over alpha. I should mention that alpha is between zero and two strictly. So this is actually not a norm when alpha is between zero and one. It's a norm when alpha is between one and two, including one. In particular, if you consider L alpha spaces, that not going to be a Banach space when alpha is between zero and one. Okay. Secondly, thirdly, we have a non-singular G action, phi t on this S, such that, okay, now this I put in red because this is going to be the most important of these three, such that all the finite dimensional distributions of XTs, all the finite linear combinations of XTs, we know that they are symmetric alpha stable, but they're their uh, sigma parameter, the scale parameter, would the function mu 
the, sorry, the measure mu, the function f, and the non-singular action phi. T. Now I'm going to write it down how exactly it's going to look at. So the linear combination will look will be symmetric alpha solution with scale parameter being the L alpha norm. Again, I'm abusing the terminology of linear combination of the functions FTIs. But what are FTIs? I just have a function f. From f and this phi t, I'll manufacture the functions FTIs. How does it look? So this is the this is what makes it more complicated. So phi ft is essentially, let's forget about this part first, okay? It's essentially, so f composed with phi t. So phi t is a map from s to s, and f is a map from s to r, so f composed phi t is a map from s to s. So essentially what I do is I, I look at f, but I twist it using this action phi t. Now the problem is, this is this measure mu is not necessarily measure preserving, it's only non-singular, so therefore, if I do that, this may not be in L alpha anymore. So in order to make it in L alpha, I have to make a correction, and that correction comes from this radon recording derivative poseidon. Okay, so this is how you should think of it. This is basically F applied to phi t, except that you need this correction factor because the, the action is not necessarily measure preserving. If the action is measure preserving, this will be just one, you will just see this guy. Okay, what I'm telling you is true, except for there is a plus minus one in the beginning, which I'm, I'm deliberately, not keep, I don't want you to see. Okay, so the converse also holds in the sense that if you start with these three objects, a standard measure space, an L alpha function, and a non-singular action, you can manufacture or you can construct a symmetric alpha stable random field, stationary symmetric alpha stable random field, such that this equation holds, this finite dimension distribution is given by these guys. So if you forget everything, by the way, this, this function, this collection of functions is called a Rosinski representation of xt. So I'd like to say two things. If you forget everything, just remember that once you have a symmetric alpha stable random field xt, it gives rise to a non-singular action. And the finite dimensional distributions of xt's are given in, in terms of this function f, this measure mu, and this action part. This is called R of representation because this is not unique. Okay, so one thing that follows from this theory because of Rosinski work of Rosinski in 1995, by the way, he did it for the group Z, but then once you are careful enough for non-commutative group, you can extend it to for any countable group. Now, very, various probabilistic properties of the random field will be connected to the ergodic theoretic properties of the underlying non-singular action. Here is a list. I'm not going to go through it. May, you know, so these are work of my advisor with his co-authors, and some of them are with, uh, uh, with me or some other, uh, other people. Now, the present work actually carries this link between ergodic theory and probability theory forward to, to the to the von Neumann algebra, the world of von Neumann algebra. And this is done through this uh, seminal work of Murray and von Neumann in 1936, which I'll briefly tell you what it is. Okay, so how am I doing in terms of time? I'm just a minute late. Okay, fine. So uh, the next thing would be about von Neumann algebras. So uh, is there any question on the stable random field that I need to answer? There is nothing so far, Parthanil. Okay, okay, thank you. So. I'll give you a very brief overview of a von Neumann algebra. So this is basically, I'll give, give you a definition of von Neumann algebras, but I'll give what is called a concrete definition of von Neumann algebra. So suppose you have a separable Hilbert space H over C, and you look at all bounded linear operators on that. That's for BH. B comes from bounded. Now we know that that has a natural topology called norm topology, which is the natural norm on the operators. Now, one can think of this uh, topology. By the way, I'm giving you the convergence of the top, you know, of topology for a net. I don't need to take a net because this is metrizable. I could have taken a sequence, but later on I'll need nets. That's why I'm taking nets from now on. If you think of it, this is just the topology of uniform convergence on bounded subsets of H, when on H we are taking the inner product topology. Okay? But the problem of this topology is that this is very strong. It's a strong topology. That's what it's called, a right? strong topology. So it's a very restrictive and strong topology. And even if H is separable to start with, BH may not be separable. That's a problem. Okay. Now it, it's difficult to carry out sophisticated analysis because of this. 
So therefore, we need a weaker topology. This is this is to denote that it's a strictly weaker topology, and this topology is called strong operator topology. So if you, you forget the description, it's basically you have a uniform convergence, you relax it to pointwise convergence. So this is the topology of pointwise convergence when on H you have the inner product. So that's precisely strong operator. Now we can even weaken it further. We have so far we have only weakened the convergence. So we can also weaken the topology on H. We can take the weak topology on H, and that will give us what is called a weak operator. The convergence criteria for uh, for a net is given here. Okay, so in other words, there are three topologies. One is the non-topology, the one start to start with, and then there is a strong operator topology and the weak operator topology. And this is the order in which uh, they occur. Now the theorem of von Neumann uh, actually connects uh, these two topologies and also uh, this analysis on using these topologies with the algebra this way. So. Suppose M is a star subalgebra of BH. What do I mean by that? So I mean by that it is that M is closed undertaking. Uh, so it's a M is a vector subspace of BH, and it's closed under uh, you know the product. And then uh, it's star subalgebra. So whenever uh, an operator is there, its star is also there, and it contains the identity operator. So it's a unital star subalgebra of H BH. Then the following statements are equivalent. So M is closed under weak operator topology, it's closed under strong operator topology, and M equals its double commutant. Now, what is double commutant? The commutant of S is just all elements T coming from the BH, all the operators on H, all bounded operators on H that commute with everything in M. That's the commutant of M. Now you can similarly define the commutant of M dash by just replacing M dash here instead of M. Okay. Now you see. Trivially, by the definition, M will be a subset of its double commutant. However, when M is closed, either under weak or strong operator topology, which are actually equivalent, then this is actually an equality. This is what this statement is saying. Now, note that the first two are just analytic properties, but the third one is actually an algebraic. So this result actually beautifully connects algebra and analysis on, on this kind of star subalgebra of the H containing one. So therefore, one minute, just give me one. Sorry. So this, uh, of course, I, I must say that, you know, this al algebra and analysis here are not completely independent. That's why this result could be proved. And in particular, that makes uh, them not independent are the projections. Now, there are lots of projections in M, projection operators. Which are which are both algebraic and analytic features, and they connect to each other nicely, so that this theorem is proved. So the, this gave rise to the subject of one Neumann algebra, and for which some references are given here, and it will be also given in the end of the slide. So a unital star algebra of BH satisfying one and hence all of the above conditions is called a von Neumann algebra. It's also called a W star algebra. The, this term, the W star algebra, will be important for us in this talk. Okay, so then. There is a special kind of von Neumann algebra which plays a very important role in the structure of von Neumann algebras. Now, in some sense, if you if you are an ergodic theorist, ergodic decomposition, you know, decomposition of an, of a space into ergodic components gives you sort of like the building blocks. Or if you are a representation theorist, irreducible representations give you the building blocks. Similarly, for von Neumann algebras, the building blocks are called factors. Now, what are factors? So a von Neumann algebra M is called a factor if its center is trivial. Now, what do I mean by that? So center is essentially M intersection M commutant, which means you just look at all the operators coming from the ambient von Neumann algebra that commutes with everything in M. So that's the center of M. You can see that the identity operator commutes with everything trivially. And any scalar times identity operator will also commute with everything. So therefore, that's all the scalar operators, which is denoted by C times one, the set of all scalar operators. This is trivially a subset of the center. Now, if actually the center happens to be exactly equal to that, that is the center is trivial, then we'll say M is a factor. Now, why is it the building block? That's again a result of von Neumann, which says any von Neumann algebra can be decomposed into a direct sum or more generally a direct integral factors. In other words, there exists a measure space on which you can write it 
as factors, integral of factors. So this integral, I'm not defining to you what it means. It has to, it will take like uh, two talks to just define it, I think. So if you want to know about it, there's a very nice uh, master thesis by Soren Kutby, which very nicely describes this direct integral. You might look at that. And of course, the standard references that I, I gave uh, are also going to be useful. So I'm not going to tell you what it means, but in the special, okay, I'll tell you the special case later. So, so in other words, for a von Neumann algebra, so an operator algebra, it's enough to study and classify factors because they, they form the building block in some sense. Now this classification of factor is a huge literature and I'm going, it has a huge literature and I'm going to put everything under the carpet. And I'm going to only tell you a particular type of factor. That also I'm not going to tell you completely precisely. So this is called two one factor. Factor M, so factor means a uh, von Neumann algebra which has trivial center, as I told you earlier. So it is called, called of type 2 1 if M is infinite dimensional as a vector space and it admits a normalized stress. So this is a rigorous enough definition, except that I haven't told you what is a trace. A trace is a continuous linear functional from M to C, satisfying it's a you know normalized meaning trace of the identity operator has to be one. And trace of AB equal to, will be equal to trace of PA, and trace of A star A will be bigger than or equal to zero for all A. In A. Note that if you if you if if your M is finite dimensional, and basically is a matrices say of some dimension D, then of course trace satisfies usual trace for matrices satisfies all these conditions. Now what is this continuous? I'm saying I'm not going to tell you what topology I'm taking. It has to be slightly stronger than the slightly stronger than the uh, weak operator topology because weak operator topology is too weak. It's called ultra weak uh, topology, but uh, under that it has to be continuous. But I'm not going to tell you. Uh, okay, so this is a definition that we coined in this paper. So a fundamental algebra to M is said to admit no two one factor in its central decomposition. By the way, that decomposition into factors. Uh, Uh, the direct integral is called central decomposition. Most all factors in the central decomposition, they're also called fibers. They are not of two one factor. Now, if Y is countable, I should have told you last slide itself, and rho is the counting measure, then this direct integral becomes a direct sum. Okay. In this special case, we are just saying that all the MYs are type two one, and none of the MYs is of is type two one. Is what this this definition is saying. Okay, now this definition is going to become important later on. I uh, will come back to that. Uh, so this is uh, again the, I'm just flashing the definition of non-singular G action. Remember, it's just a group action acting measurably on on, on a nice space, central measure space S, such that uh, you know all the measure classes are preserved under this map. Okay, now suppose you have a group countable group with an identity element E, and you have a sigma finite standard measure space, and you have a non-singular G action S on this. This is the slide which is completely quote unquote because I'm not going to be completely vague here. I'm going to be putting everything under the carpet. Following the work of Murray and von Neumann, by the way, you can look at these lecture notes of uh, you know, von Jones or Jesse Peterson. They're both very nice from them. Uh, Learned it so. So you're preserving case, but it can be a measure preserving non singular case as well. One can construct a von Neumann algebra. Forget everything else. I don't even want you to read this part. That encodes ergodic theoric features of phi in some way. It, it can be constructed as a subalgebra actually of uh, of of this space. But uh, let's not let's not remember that. But the point is, this is a von Neumann algebra that encodes this uh, the, the properties of this action. Okay, very nice. So the notation would be either this or that. Obviously, this is more difficult to write. So we'll most of the time we'll know what the action is. We'll write it like that. And one comment I would like to make here before we go to the next one is that this L infinity of S mu. So this is something like a something like a, a semi-direct product of groups. So L infinity of S mu, by the way, are all the commutative algebras, commutative von Neumann algebras. So in other words, that's why von Neumann algebra is called a non-commutative measure theory. Because if you look at commutative von Neumann algebras, you just get these spaces. 
And then that's just measure theory. Right? L infinity theory is just a measure theory. And so therefore, this is called a non-commutative measure theory. And what you are doing by twisting with this group G is that you're making this, this into a no, highly non-commutative von Neumann algebra. And in some sense, this L infinity is sitting something like a normal subgroup inside this thing, which is through this cross product relation, which I'm completely hiding under the cover. Okay, so this is, a, it doesn't say much, but I just wanted to say that. So time wise, I'm doing well, so I can but, take questions. Parthani, if... there has been one question. Yes. I'm not sure anybody else can answer. Uh, Mahan has asked, what does encode ergodic properties mean? Yes, uh, it's a good question. So for example, okay, I'll, I'll see one of the things. For example, one of the things uh, will be clear. For example, if two actions are orbit equivalent, in the sense that if they have the same orbits uh, under some one, one, on two map, then their corresponding group measure space constructions are going to be isomorphic. This is just one of the things. So it's definitely, you know, the isomorphism, uh, sorry, not isomorphism, the orbit equivalence class of, uh, of uh, group actions can definitely be read off from the classes of, uh, you know, these von Neumann algebras. So this is one of the things. Many ergodic theoretic properties are sort of hidden there. So one more thing will come in the proof, so I'll mention that at that time, okay? Thanks for the question, it's a very good question, yeah. I didn't even explain what it is, so I, I cannot answer it fully, but partial answer perhaps. Is that okay? Okay, we'll see more concrete answer later. Let me go ahead now, okay? So this is the link between uh, stable random fields and uh, von Neumann algebras that I'm going to talk about. So as I said, from stable random field using the work of Jan Rosinski in 1995, one can construct through the Rosinski representation, one can apply this. The representation is not unique. So this, so nor is this uh, non-singular action, but this is unique. Once you have a non-singular action, this is unique. And the question is, is it unique? Answer of Uh, Parthenil, your video seems to be keep freezing and even audio. Maybe you want to uh, stop the video to help. I think Parthenil is off the internet. I think. Yeah, I think it's internet or power something is off. Uh, yes. So let's wait a few minutes. Uh, He's back on, but I somehow it's not. Yeah, he's on. He has sent a chat and what about it? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's having a dynamic eyes oh, yeah. back. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Can, yeah. Turn your video off and okay. share. Actually, Stopnit is having a live class. Yeah. I'm just sharing this thing. Oh, I have to share the slide, no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so Apnil is having a video class, and that's why live class. So two, two things you cannot take, I think. That's okay. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's coming. Started. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And voice is okay? Yeah. There is one question, Parthanil. Uh, yeah. Again, Mahan, uh, is the group measure space the same as the cross product von Neumann algebra? Yes, yes, yes. So cross product von Neumann algebra is a more, has a more abstract definition. This is a special kind of cross product, yes. Cross product okay. construction and uh, group measure space construction is the same. It's a very special case of cross product construction, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me just go through this part. I don't know how much you could hear. So uh, 
From stable random field, you can go to a non-singular group action through Dawson's representation, and this is not unique. And then you can get a group measure space construction through Maria and von Neumann, which is unique. And the question is, is this unique? If you go from here to here by commuting these two. Now the answer is it's not unique in general, but it is unique provided the Rossinsky representation is what is called minimal. Now what is minimal? So minimal means any Rossinsky representation can be represented in terms, it can be written in terms of that representation. So and I'm, I'm being very vague here. So it's minimal in a specific sense. Yes, I'm not going to tell you what it means, but if it's minimal, then the answer is yes. And then of course, question is how useful this is. And I, uh, as I will see that there is some use to this. Uh, okay, so here is the first result. And this is, uh, if you have a less stationary S alpha S random field indexed by a countable group, and if you have two G actions, which are obtained from two minimal representations, again, minimal meaning in some sense it's minimal. So any, any, any Rossinsky representation should be able to be written in terms of that representation. Then the corresponding group measure space constructions are going to be isomorphic as von Neumann algebras. So minimal representation is not necessarily unique, but the corresponding von Neumann algebras are unique. And in particular, the group measure space construction corresponding to a minimal representation becomes an invariant for this stationary alpha is random. Now this proof, I'm going to give this proof with an apology to uh, Paul Ardush because this is going to be a joke. Okay, so this is my joke and this is my proof in this talk. So the, as you will see, the proof is just two lines. So essentially, once you have two minimal representations then a result of Rosinski, which he proved for Z, by just simple extension of that, you'll get that the two, two, two uh, actions are actually isomorphic as group actions. So isomorphic meaning, we just have a map between the, the, the corresponding spaces S1 and S2 that just takes the action here to action there, that's it. If they're isomorphic, so this is also called conjugate as, as group actions. If they're isomorphic as group actions, then by the way, this extension just needs, you have to be a little bit careful because of the potential non commutativity of the group, that's all. Once they're isomorphic as group actions, they're isomorphic, uh, they're actually orbit equivalent because the orbits are preserved. Orbit equivalence is a weaker, weaker equivalence. So therefore this will hold. And once they're equivalent by a result of Singer that I was mentioning to uh, the answer of Mohan's question, these corresponding group measure space constructions are going to be isomorphic as well. And that proves that for any minimal representation, these are going to be isomorphic. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, as you see, the proof is a joke because you have, you just have to put everything, everything is tailor-made in the, in the thing. So if, if the proof will go through. By the way, Singer proved this uh, result for a uh, measure preserving case, but this extension also was done later, right? I don't know the exact reference, but I think it's, it was known and then very. Parthanil, there is a question about the proof. Sorry. There is a question about the proof. Yes, yes. Uh, Mohan has asked the. Yes. Conjugation is measure preserving. That is, is the conjugation measure preserving in the first step of the proof? No, uh, the conjugation has to be okay. The conjugation has to be non singular in the sense that the map, you, if your map is H, the mu1 compose H inverse would be uh, equivalent to mu2. That's a very good question. So if you have, if you go to the category of measure preserving actions, then conjugation has to be measure preserving. But when you go to the category of non singular actions, then it's enough for the uh, map to be non-singular. That's a very good question because otherwise you're making it too restrictive. Yeah. I think that answers my question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, it's the, but that's enough, you, you know, for, for, for orbit equivalence, that's good enough. All we need is orbit equivalent. So that's, that's good enough. By the way, this is the definition of conjugacy for non-singular actions. I checked it. So this was one of my lockdown things that I, I did. Okay. Okay, so uh, the minimal group measure space construction, I'll call any group measure space construction coming from any minimal representation of a particular S alpha S random field, minimal group measure space construction, because this is unique up to one number algebra isomorphism. Okay, so this becomes an invariant for any stationary S alpha S random field. Same holds for what stationary max stable random fields, if you know what they are. They are instead of extending theorem 3.6 of Rosinski. 
we did earlier, you have to extend proposition 6.1, same thing will go through. The question is, how much this invariant remembers the random thing? Okay. So what I'm asking is the following. So this is more precise question. If two stationary alpha is random fields, not necessarily indexed by the same group, have isomorphic minimal group major space constructions, then do they have similar probabilistic properties? This is the question. So remember meaning in the following sense. So this question parallels the theory of what is called W star rigidity. This is a term coined on paper of uh, Ibrian Iona, which uh, came out in the ICM proceedings. And also there is a uh, very nice I, I, ICM lecture by Adrian on YouTube, which elaborates on W strategy. This is about group actions. Two group actions, the W strategy for group actions roughly means how much the corresponding group major space construction remembers the properties of the action. So instead of actions, we are now asking the same kind of questions for random fields. Okay. What about Rosinski representation? Minimal representation is an invariant, but Rosinski representation is not even unique. Okay. So how much does R Rosinski representation, as opposed to the minimal, okay, uh, corresponding, uh, uh, if you take a Rosinski representation, go to the corresponding group major space construction, we'll call it R Rosinski group major space construction. Remember the stable random field. Now, obviously, it may not be as strong as the minimal group major space construction because it's not even unique up to, up to RBT Kibbanes or up to, uh, not even unique up to Panji Kesi. However, any Rosinski representation can be written in terms of any minimal representation. That is actually the definition of minimal representation, which I kept on hiding. We therefore conjecture that many von Neumann algebraic aspects of the corresponding group major space construction will actually become invariants. And many stochastic properties of the field will actually be remembered. Uh, is there a question? Okay. Uh, is there a question that? Uh, uh, yes, Parthanil, there is a question. Is there yeah. a correspondence, minimal representation, factor, ergodicity? So, ergodicity of the field or ergodicity of the action? Mm, I think Mahan can then unmute himself and ask or? Yeah, can, can, can you unmute, unmute Mahan? Yeah. Yeah. Unmute. yeah, yeah. So, what I'm asking is, uh, so you have a Fonerman algebra and you have yeah. a decomposition into factors. Right. So, if the, the in the case that the action is ergodic, does this correspond to a factor? I mean, there is that. No yes, uh, I, I, you have to just only thing you are right, you are absolutely right. Except that you also have to assume that action is free. If the action is free, the answer is yes. Okay. So, if the action uh, is free, uh, ergodic. Presumably, it, it is, essentially free, essentially free in the measure category. Yeah, 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 in the measure category. Yeah, yeah. Anything is essential. I mean. Okay, fine. Uh, that's yeah, one yeah. Thing. because we have and, a countable uh, group, so there is no measure theoretic issues at all. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, this question that you asked is going to play a very important role later. I'll point it out. Okay. Uh, one other thing. So yeah. what about the probability side, the representation side? If, if the Rosinski representation is minimal, does it correspond to factors? No, no, no. Not no. necessarily. Okay, Only fine. thing you can say is the corresponding actions are, are going to be conjugate. That's all. No, it does no, I mean, if, uh, I'm saying that if you have a, if you have a, so do, do ergodic actions correspond, correspond to special Rosinski representation? I oh, guess that's yes. The... Uh, in special class classes, yes. For example, there is something called mixed moving average. Yes, that, that, oh, now I, am, I get your question. So there is something called mixed moving average. Yeah. If you have a mixed moving average, then ergodicity of the action will correspond to, instead of mixed moving, you just become a simple moving average. Yes. It definitely does restrict the probabilistic properties. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay. So then, many stochastic properties, we hope they will be remembered. We have actually exhibited two such instances in this work when the group is ZD. Unfortunately, we can't extend it further and tell you the, what is the hindrance also. And both ergodicity and the complete non-ergodicity, the complete lack of ergodicity, are going to be W star rigid properties for a stable random. I'll tell you what exactly it means. Also. And from now on, unless mentioned otherwise, G is going to be ZT for, for some time. Okay, so this is the, let me do the time check. I'm going a little slow, but that's okay, I guess. So the operator algebraic characterization of uh, godicity. 
So first of all, what is ergodicity? I'll go a little bit quick here. So recall that any random field doesn't even have to be stationary alpha stable as S alpha S. Okay. Any random field induces a measure on the path space by looking at the law of X. Okay. You collect all those omegas in omega so that X T omega is in some set. This whole thing is in some set, subset of R power Z D. This is going to be a measurable subset of omega because each X T is measurable and there are bound to be many such. So therefore I can apply P of that. That's going to be, give me the law of X. Now stationarity just means that this law is preserved on the left shift. Left stationarity just means left shift. Okay. This is, this X T is called ergodic when the shift action on this space is ergodic in the sense that if you look at the shift action, all the shift invariant subsets of R power Z D are just P X trivial. Okay. So then we say this X T is ergodic. So X T is ergodic means the induced dynamical system is ergodic. Now, why is it important? It's important because it helps in proving limit theorems. Once you have ergodicity, you can use the ergodic theorem and get a non, you get a constant limit that helps in various fields. Ergodic, not only ergodic theory, but also in geometry, which Mohan can say much more, I guess. And then also probability and statistics. In statistics, this can be used to give consistent, strongly consistent estimators. Now, in uh, d equal to one, Samoniski actually gave a criterion based on ergodic theory properties of the coming from our Sinskri representation. For d bigger than one, we we are able to extend this uh, in this of ergodic theory. Or Z T index. Can you all hear me? I guess. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Again, it was for a minute not clear. Okay. So is there anything specific that I should tell again, or it's okay? Sorry I about it. I heard up to the D equal to one part. Uh, okay. So D bigger than one, we just extended the result. The D equal to one uh, a criteria was given uh, by this uh, by my advisor in uh, 2005, using the properties of the underlying action. And that was extended in this work. And in this particular work, the one I'm presenting, a new characterization is given using group measure space construction for all D. Is that like okay now? Yeah, I think it looks okay. Okay. So here is the result of ergodicity via one number algebras. So suppose you have a stationary surface random field generated by a free. Now, this is the free is coming from essentially exactly, by the way, free is essentially free, as Mohan said, for the reason why but that Mohan asked free non-singular action and then xt is ergodic. Uh, Parthanil, again your audio or so has proven. In this case happens to be equivalent to weak mixing. Okay, well, in this situation not much can be done. Is it better now? I'm trying to see. I'll, I'll just open the one. Now it is okay. Okay. Now this class wasn't scheduled earlier. It was scheduled uh, just because of the independence day. So anyway, so I think it's okay now, right? Yeah. So I, I might just go closer to the, so uh, I'm just going closer to the router. So uh, just give me a minute. Um, okay, maybe this will help. Yeah, so, uh, so X is ergodic which is actually equivalent to weak mixing, if and only if the corresponding group measure space construction admits no two one factor in its central decomposition. We had this de definition earlier, remember? So if you go to the central decomposition, you won't see any two one factor in it. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So 
algebraic set is equivalent to this particular von neumann algebraic property of the corresponding group measure space construction as long as this non singular action is free in the in the rossinsky representation now therefore admitting no two one factor in the central decomposition this is a completely von neumann algebraic property this becomes this is preserved for any rossinsky group measure space construction which is free when i'm abusing the term here he, that, that means that the corresponding action is free. By the way, free means, I should have told you this, an action is called free if its stabilizers are all trivial, in the sense that any non-identity identity element of the group is actually going to shift the points non-trivial. So this is what this means. So what I'm saying in this corollary is basically, if you have a free Rosinski group measure space construction, of random fields, a self stationary random field that admits no to one factor in its central decomposition, then the same is true about any free Rosinski group measure space construction of the same random field. So this is just uh, this particular property, which is purely von Neumann algebraic in some sense, is preserved under all free Rosinski group measure space constructions. Now, another connection is this, another corollary is this. If you have two stationary self as random field indexed by possibly two different ZDs, Z1 and Z2, say, uh, as long as they have isomorphic Rosinski group measure space constructions such that the corresponding action is free, then one is ergodic, if and only if the other one is so. And ergodic is equivalent to weak mixing also. And that's because the characterization is complete in terms of this Rosinski group measure space construction it's in its von Neumann algebraic problem. So as long as you have the isomorphic, ergodicity will be remembered. So in particular, if they are generated by orbit equivalent free actions, then same ergodicity would be equivalent for the two. And the T's can be different. That's the interesting part. Now, why for orbit equivalent? Because if they are orbit equivalent, automatically the corresponding group justice constructions are going to be the same as fundamental algebras. There is a question. Uh, how important is ZD is a question. Yes, I'll come to that. Yeah, I'll okay. come to that. Yeah. The indexing groups having different, possibly different rank, ranks, by rank I mean the, the D, okay, is actually very useful in this context, so orbit equivalence. Why? Because there is a seminal result of uh, Alan Pons, Jacob Feldman, and Benji Weiss that states that any non singular action of ZD, more generally any amenable group, is actually orbit equivalent to some non singular Z action. So in other words, what this already will then say is that it is possible to associate a stationary self as process to any stationary self as random field indexed by ZD in an ergodicity preserving manner. This is amazing because you have, we may have a very high dimensional uh, indexed uh, random field, but you can always associate a process indexed by Z such that ergodicity is preserved through this orbit equivalence. So this may help in the classification of such fields, the you know, ergodic, ergodic fields. Anyway, so the sketch of the proof, this is, I'm going to be a bit fast. As you can see, the, it uses results from all over, you know, von Neumann algebras, you can operate algebra here, ergodic decomposition, probabilistic input, and so on. But major step, as Mohan, since Mohan had pointed this out already, is that first to do it when actually the action is also ergodic. If you want to do it for ergodic actions, then using a result of von Neumann algebras, you will be able to do it directly. This is the result in von Neumann algebras. You may not be able to read well, but uh, you know I'll share the slides anyway later, so you can you can read it well. And then once you use that result from von Neumann algebra, the rest is done by this theorem of uh, ours. Now going from general ergodic general case to the ergodic case, naturally would be to use ergodic decomposition. And this is possible thanks to the, this, uh, this particular result of this book, uh, Klaus Schmidt book. And then standard measure space for a very important role there. And then ergodic decomposition is naturally connected to the central decomposition of the corresponding group measure space construction. This is an operator algebra. And this is something I think Mohan was anyway pointing out. So as long as the action is free, all of this will go through. Okay? And uh, from the proof, it follows that actually free is not needed as long as it's ergodically free. This is again a term we coined. It means that the action is essentially free on all the ergodic components. That's good enough. So 
this is obviously weaker because the number of ergodic components can be uncountable. So if something is ergodically free, it's not necessarily free. Other way around is true, but if something is ergodically free, it may not be. Now we can also show that XT is fully non-ergodic if and only if almost all factors are of type 2, 1. This transpires actually from the proof. And same characterization of ergodicity holds also for max stable things. And some future directions are here. The last one is the most important one. This is basically the question that was already asked in the chat. What about you know, other than ZD? And interestingly, the hindrance is not at all operator algebraic, but ergodic theoretic. So the main problem is an unavailability of ergodic theorem for non-singular actions of groups. So Lindenstrass has a very nice work where he actually has ergodic theorem for a measured probability measure preserving actions of uh, any amenable group. If that could be extended to uh, you know, not necessarily measure preserving and also the measure allowed to be a sigma finite infinite measure uh, for non-singular actions, then we would be true. But that is not known. The only case where this is sort of known is the, this is the work of Yaret, uh, who, who actually proved it uh, for Heisenberg groups, discrete Heisenberg groups. So at least we can perhaps do it for discrete Heisenberg groups and we'll have to see. And I don't know much. And since I don't know much, I think I should stop. Thank you. And sorry for the disturbance. Uh, okay, first, um, I think participants can unmute themselves. We will give a round of applause to Parthanil. So any question, you can either post it in the chat or uh, ask, uh, un uh, unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, let me see the chat. Is there any pending question that I need to answer? Uh, no, there was maybe one we can do later. Uh, Patanil, can you go back to the last slide, I mean, where you ex uh, expanded on this question for uh, more general groups? So what exactly is the trouble yes. for other amenable, other amenable groups, say, other than yes, ZD? Yes, the problem is the, okay. So, yes, so Lindenstrass had proved uh, that, uh, the, you know, L1 ergodic theorem, or say pointwise ergodic theorem, he could prove it for probability measure preserving actions. So if the action is probability measure preserving, then you can prove the ergodic theorem. Now for uh, non-similar actions. You know, probability measure preserving for what? I mean, uh, what is the kind of action? Actions of amenable groups. Public measure preserving actions of amenable groups on any 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 measure space. Uh huh. Uh, then there is any, any, any probability space actually. Any probability. Space. Yeah. So if it is uh, essentially free, it is ergodic. That's the statement of Lindenstrass's theorem. No, no, no. Uh, er, er, what is that? It's er, ergodic theorem. So you take the uh, averages. You take the time. Oh, it's an ergodic theorem. Oh, ergodic theorem. Yeah. L L one ergodic theorem and pointwise almost sure. Ergodic. Okay. Okay. Fine. 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 So. So, so problem uh, is we have to do it for non-singular actions. So not necessarily measure preserving, and also it, the measure can yeah. be infinite measure. So this so is I the I think there is a there is a version by Bader and Furman, uh, okay. relatively recent, um, where they look at non-singular actions. So essentially, what you are trying to do is you take a point, take an orbit. Take okay. zero sums, and you want to prove that it converges to the the given measure as a stationary measure. Is that the point? Yes, yes, uh, exactly. So uh, actually, Nishant has written in the chat that Hoffman has a theorem, a pointwise ergodic theorem for non-singular action, and that uh, hold. Oh, okay. Uh, 